So that was such a nice in, uh, introduction, uh, really beautiful. And I just was thinking the whole time, and, like, and I'm still trying to figure this stuff out. <laughs> like, I don't really know what I'm doing. Uh, and the, the landscape changes all, every moment, right? So um, I want to take you guys back to 2004. Uh, when I first started teaching, um, it, it was my dream job, and so it meant a lot to me to hang on to it. And as you know, academia is a crowded field, and, and so I, I always was looking over my shoulder just waiting for somebody to, to fire me and let somebody else <laughs> take my position. So I was really nervous about my first day teaching, and I, I had to teach in these really big lecture halls, which can be really intimidating to a young scholar especially. And I remember what it was like in, in 2004. I just want to remind you, because uh, it can seem like, that, that doesn't seem like that long ago, and yet just keep in mind that back then there was no Wi-Fi in this room. There was Wi-Fi, but our campus was not updated to Wi-Fi yet. There was no YouTube, Netflix, or other high-quality digital content that you were competing with, potentially. There were very few laptops in the room. There were fewer cell phones, and there were no smartphones. The I iPhone didn't come out until 2007. Now, all that can seem like, what's the big deal? But it really was a different environment to teach in. I don't know if you remember that, but it really was different. The only meaningful technology in the room was the projector, and you controlled that. <laughs> you know, like, So you essentially controlled the, the most interesting uh, content, and you were the gateway to the most interesting content. And in general, you could assume that your students were paying attention to you, they weren't at least, they at least weren't competing, you weren't competing with uh, YouTube, Netflix, and, and so on. So fast forward a bit to 2008, I'm still teaching in the same room, and by then I was starting to see uh, quite a few changes, and of course there was, there was something in the air, there's literally something in the air, and that was, you know, Wi-Fi and 3G access and things like that, and that made a difference. I, I made a, a video about this, just kind of thinking about this new environment that was in the air all around us, and I started just by reflecting on text, because as a scholar, you know, text was everything to me. And I started to realize that text was unilinear and written on paper, but it, it started to look different when it was placed into a digital environment. So I just made this quick little video to explain like how hypertext is different. I'm just speeding it up because it's kind of a nerdy part here. But um, basically, I was just looking at how you know HTML. This shift from from HTML to um, to separating form and content in new forms of HTML was changing the way the web works. So that ultimately the web was not just about linking information, but linking people, and all these people were sharing, trading, and collaborating. And, at the end of this video, I just wanted to point out that this was going to force us to rethink a number of things. So that was 2007, and of course, it wasn't just those things we had to rethink. When I was back in the classroom, I had this sense that the classroom itself suddenly felt out of place and outdated with the media environment my students were in. And so I made a follow-up video to that, which was basically about the classroom and, and looking at what the message of the classroom was. Like if these walls could talk, what would they say? And if you think about from the John Dewey perspective that students learn what they do, then what are they learning when they're sitting here? And it struck me that what they were learning was that the information is up here and that they should follow along. And meanwhile, they're immersed in this digital environment that offered all kinds of other opportunities. And so I wanted to invite the students in to share their thoughts on education today. So I just created a Google Doc. Uh, and I just asked them, what's it like being a student today? That was the opening question. I added all of them into the Google Doc, and then we just started collaborating together on this, basically writing the script for the video that you're watching now. You can see a lot of blank spaces. Those were places where we needed survey data, so we then surveyed ourselves using those questions that we created. And then we just put together this, this little video. Hmm. <laughs> 
So that, that whole video is up on, on YouTube if you're interested in seeing the rest of it. Um, the point, of course, is that the room had changed between 2004 and 2008. This something in the air was really nothing less than the digital artifacts of you know, over a billion people on the planet connecting and collaborating in ways that we had never really connected and collaborated before. And we were really kind of in this cultural moment of trying to think about what that meant. I remember uh, turning back to Seymour Papert, who I always look to as uh, kind of one of the original heroes and great thinkers about where educational technology was going to go. And back in the early 90s, he had predicted this this uh, Web 2.0 social media revolution. And he had said that he had called it at that time the knowledge machine. He basically said, someday you'll be able to just pull up any tablet. He actually imagined a tablet at that time. And that you would be able to pull up this tablet and call forth any information from anywhere. And not only that, but then able, be able to share information back to everybody, uh, to anybody anywhere. So he essentially imagined this back then. He called it the knowledge machine, but he said, there's a critical thing here. And he said the, the knowledge machine will only work on questions. And if you don't know good, if you don't have good questions to ask the machine, you're not going to get good results out. And then he went further and he said, the real danger here is that this knowledge machine uh, will actually be the world's most seductive distraction device. And now, fast forward to 2014, and my classroom is updated. It looks very nice, you know, and, and there's all sorts of new technology in there. But uh, it's actually a lot harder to teach in this room because I think the distraction device side might have won. Uh, by 2014, it certainly seems that way. So there's a series of new challenges. There's extremely seductive distractions, not just for our students, but for ourselves. And they're in our pockets and on our laptops and so on. There's just such fantastic content. Um, there are, you know, a hundred times more high quality television shows than there were just 10 years ago because of, you know, Netflix and HBO and Showtime, all these new, uh, and, and it's all on demand and so on. And so absenteeism is on the rise. Uh, I feel like I'm a better teacher than ever, and yet I still can't hold the audience like I used to in 2004. There's also mental health issues, anxiety, depression, and so on. Some of that probably tied to lack of sleep and, uh, and the digital media sort of always on uh, issues. There's also alternative facts. There's ideological pluralism. And I want to point out that these, uh, these, are, uh, uh, these alternative facts are also very sophisticated and highly produced and in many cases more superficially convincing than anything you can say in a lecture. And so th this, is, this is a real problem. And of course, all of this is then inside of filter bubbles. So filter bubble meaning that you know, your Facebook look, looks different than my Facebook and so on because it's essentially personalized and therefore filtered. And we end up inside these filter bubbles that uh, ultimately then this is all within an environment of economic insecurity, the basic trust of students that they can go to school for four years and get a job, that trust is now broken. And this is all framed within a world of rising costs and shrinking budgets. And so all of this together really framed 2014 as a time of, of three crises that were on the horizon. One was a crisis of funding. Uh, another one was a crisis of trust. And a third one was a crisis of significance. And what I mean by the crisis of significance was because of the other issues, a lot of students were sitting in the room in, uh, in a near panic or certainly uh, just sort of not feeling the connection to what they were learning. Why are they in gen ed classes became a really big issue by this time. And a lot of students uh, feeling like their education wasn't worth it. Ultimately, there are a lot of people losing faith in the institution by 2014. And that was the environment that we had to to teach in. Meanwhile, the digital environment that was surrounding all of this seemed to be suggesting that this stuff could be, you know, it's free, high quality, on demand, it's socially relevant, and it's personalized. And this, and it's full of great information and great knowledge experience. And so a lot of people started to feel like there was a promise of a cheaper and better alternative, which again is threatening to some extent to higher education and what we do in the classroom. Uh, so that's where we're at, and I just want to point out that this was all 
Like we each have our own personal stories of, of how we live through these crises. And maybe some of you haven't yet felt the, the brute force of those crises yet. Um, but some of us have, and I know that here in Wisconsin with the, what's going on at Stevens Point and so on, uh, there certainly must be some of you that are, are very much feeling the brute force of this. For me personally, the new realities were uh, this. One was I noticed more disengagement, and I can tell a really clear story about this. In 2004, well, that room that you saw there, there's a, there's a door in the back, and the door has this really loud latch. And so, it's, it, you know, you hear it every time somebody comes in. So somebody came in late, you'd hear this, you know. So 2004, I remember about eight weeks in, um, I was teaching, and about 10 minutes into the class, I hear the door, you know. And I, I see who comes in, and I just monitor them. It's a r big room, you know. Uh, there were 400 people in that class. Uh, but I see where she sat down. And after class, I went and I talked to her about coming in late because it's disruptive. You know, this is a room of 400, 10 minutes in. Nowadays, that door is just just the whole class period. <laughs> the idea that I could single somebody out and talk to them. Uh, and, and I really, like, maybe I've lost my touch. Maybe I'm not as engaging, but I really feel like something's different. Uh, so there's more disengagement. There's falling attendance. There are fewer majors. I'm in a, you know, basically a humanity in anthropology. Um, there are budget callbacks. So this isn't just about budget cuts, but time, sometimes money that is yours and in your account actually gets called back and you have to find a way to give it back. And all of this within a framework uh, in which numbers matter more than ever. So we are now actually held accountable for how many SCHs we produce. And I didn't even know what an SCH was until a few years ago. <laughs> so if you don't know what an SCH is, it's a semester credit hour. And in our system, they matter and they keep track of these things and they give you funding based on that. So. Um, so I'm in this moment of crisis, and uh, as an anthropologist, my basic mode uh, is to revert to research, and particular type of research is participant observation. So I learned how to do participant observation in Papua New Guinea. This is my first night in Papua New Guinea. I arrived in this little village. This is really classic anthropology, which I did about 20 years ago. And you can see this is, you can't see much of it, but this is a, a dance uh, in this small village. And it's really hard to figure out what's going on. So eventually, you kind of have to join in. So you saw me there uh, joining in the dance. And this is part of what participant observation is all about. And my revelation through in participant observation uh, is if you notice here, you see me dancing here. And I used to think that this was like a really simple thing where you just like bounce up and down. But see how my feather wasn't bouncing and then it does start bouncing? So it actually is kind of hard to get your feather to bounce. You have to like really pop it, you know? Um, <laughs> And then once you start popping it, then um, the girls are running around and they'll grab at the tail feathers that are really popping. And pretty soon you see, you know, couples pairing off and going off into the woods. And when I first got there through just observation, I thought this was some sort of sacred dance, you know, thing. And I would have never known that it was also like a really good party if I hadn't participated. And so, <laughs> so participant observation is really essential to getting that, like, sense of where things are at and what, what, what's going on. So I decided to take that participant observation method to learning. And I decided to first learn from my own son, uh, who was at that time learning how to go downstairs. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was really inspiring, right? I mean, this guy is just unstoppable. <laughs> and he just does it with joy. And we filmed this over the course of months. You can see here's his, his big brother coming in and bopping him around a little bit. But, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. He just keeps on getting back up. And you can see him getting bigger now. This is several months later, still falling. <laughs> and then finally, here he gets it. <laughs> So, so, as I set off on this journey to participate and observe in higher ed and try to figure out what was going on in these crises, I decided to give myself a set of series of rules that I learned from George. Uh, first rule was to try new things. Second rule, it's all practice. Third rule, failure is fun and fascinating. And I just decided, to, I, I took like a multi-part 
uh, sort of track in this. I, I wanted to remind myself what it was like to learn hard things because I knew that's what my students were going through. I wanted to talk to my students, it's just basic, like, you know, just sort of interview research piece of this. And then I also wanted to, ultimately, I, I kind of imagine, like, really participating in some profound way, like maybe taking classes or getting involved in student life in some way where I could really feel what it's like to be a student again. And so uh, that was the plan. And so the first thing I did is I set out to learn something new. And since I... I'm a professor and an academic. I, I live in my head a lot, so I thought, I'm going to try to do something more active. And I also was really inspired by the way George, like, you could really see change, you know, as he, like, learned to go down the stairs. And uh, sometimes in intellectual endeavors, you work and work and work at something. You actually don't know if you're any better at it, you know, a few years later. So, so I decided to do something physical. And so I, I started with handstands. Um, uh, and it is amazing. Look at this. Is anybody counting this? this is, oh, yeah. That was great. That ended with uh, wrist surgery. Uh, <laughs> so, so I did make some good progress, but, uh, you know, failure is fun and fascinating. So onward, um, my, that's my left hand. I'm right-handed, so I took up drawing. And uh, drawing was something that had always been hard for me. Uh, so I just started, you know, I got a little sketchbook and I started like drawing up these different things. And one of the things about drawing for me was that um, in my college career, uh, drawing basically had wrecked my GPA. And it made me uh, think about like what these grades do. I, and because it wrecked my GPA, I stopped drawing, even though I loved drawing. And uh, I, it made me realize, you know, that, that grades, uh, this is like sort of one of my first insights in my participant observation journey was that, that grades, you know, they, they make the A's sort of happy, but kind of complacent. You all had that A student who does a calculation toward the end of the semester about just how hard they have to work on the final exam. And then they, uh, you know, don't work very hard on, on that final project if they already have an A locked in. Uh, and the Fs, of course, feel completely sort of disengaged and disenfranchised like I did with drawing. And so, so I started rethinking my grading process, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit later. Um, the other thing I did, I just started talking to the students in this picture. I started looking at old pictures and remembering some of my older students, and I just looked and looked, and I, and I, I did my best to track down all these different students. And what I found was that, um, that out of, I, I've taught maybe in this era that I'm talking about here, I had about 400 students per semester, and I was looking at like a five-year time span. There were about, uh, say, 2,000 to 4,000 students during that time. And out of that group, there was one anthropologist. Uh, so first revelation, like, I'm not there to teach future anthropologists. <laughs> you know, there's something else going on. And, you know, it's a big gen ed class. Uh, and I ended up finding a lot of pe people doing all kinds of things. And, and one of them had become a computer programmer. And this was somebody who had taken all of my classes. Uh, he was an anthropology major, and, and here he was a computer programmer. And so I, I interviewed some of these people. I, I just called them up and I asked them, you know, what mattered about a class like mine? Like, what, is, what really can you take from a class like mine and apply to your life now? And the computer programmer, who was very successful, um, had a really interesting story to tell. Uh, this, is, this is what he shared with me. So this is actually, um, you can see my drawing progressing here. Uh, I decided to take up animation as I was doing my drawing. And, and this is the this, this student story. He told me that when he was a student with me, um, he you know, I remember him being a great student. And he said, well, that was because I was always reading. And I was always in the books. But it was like life was passing me by. And then he said that when he came to my class, I was talking about this, the hero story and how this replicates all over the world, where you see these heroes called to adventure, they go on a road of trials, and then they're transformed. And he said that in the class, he met this uh, young woman who really was a hero, who had been on a road of trials, and she kind of opened him up to a whole new life. And when they met, they instantly fell in love, uh, it looked like happily ever after they raised a kid together. But then he wrote me a few years later saying this. So after that, he said he just started running. And 
and he would just run all day, all night. He would run uh, up to 20 miles a day just trying to figure things out. And he ran through all seasons, um, any weather. And he said he would even often actually run barefoot just to try to feel something, like he was just kind of numbing himself. And then one day he said he was walking, running through the park and he felt himself kind of lifted outside of his body and he could see himself running through the park. And he looked down at this person running and he, and he saw this person running through this life of trials, this road of trials. And he says he had this epiphany and he looked down on himself and he thought, my goodness, you're a hero. But it wasn't like sort of like a cocky vision of like, I'm a hero and I'm better than everybody else. He was suddenly running around the park seeing heroes everywhere. And it completely transformed the way he engaged in his life so that he credits this with ultimately saving his relationship as well. So he said that's, that's what mattered, and like in that class, right? It's like this little, you know, one week lesson that we had on, on the hero. And so I started um, talking to other students as well. And one of the things I started to realize was that there was something kind of hard to pin going on. And it wasn't about content. It was about the type of person they had become. And so I, I started looking at student development theory because I had some background in that and I knew that there was something there and I, I just dove into it now with all this, re this, this research data I had, all these interviews that I had. And what I found was that, you know, if you summarize the student development theory, what you see is it's kind of like the stage theory and I'm, I'm not really into stage theories, but I think there is something to this. I think there's something going on here. The, the basic description is that these students come into um, school and typically they think that uh, it's all about finding the answers. And so their world is all about, uh, you know, getting the answers from the professors. And early on in their college career, they, they get frustrated because the professors tend to pose questions. And they think that these are actually posed. They don't think that they're real questions. And they, they just kind of get frustrated. And they say, come on, just give me the answers so I can get the A on the exam and we can just all go home happy. And eventually they realize that there is real controversy. That, that in college especially, you're working at the edge of a discipline often. And the professor is working at the edge of the discipline. And so there is real controversy. There's debate. And, and yet the students in this phase will typically still think that if they had a, the right theory or enough information, they could still get back to that comfortable world of black and white answers, where it's just all about answers. But then something happens, usually it actually happens in their personal life. One of my favorite books for this is uh, Women's Ways of Knowing by Belinke and Clinchy in that group. And it's just such a great uh, series of interviews which shows that um, a lot of people encounter ambiguity in their life through their personal life, and then they start to realize that also translates into what's going on in sort of the, the disciplines and in classrooms as well. So they face ambiguity, and here they kind of have a, a big turning point uh, in their life. And so most of our students emerge into this state of ambiguity at some point during their college career. And if things go well, if they can embrace ambiguity and, and live with it, find a way to live comfortably with it, then they can emerge into a state of, it's almost like a state of wonder, where the world is kind of alive with possibility. That ambiguity also actually looks like opportunity. And that's where we want our students to be. And that's what I saw from my most successful students. These were students who were comfortable with ambiguity. They knew the world was messy and that it was going to be hard to figure out at times, but they embraced that. Um, back in this world of ambiguity, I decided to take a closer look and really look at my students uh, present. So I started having open lunches with students. And so that was my way of interviewing was just, I would just have an open lunch. And typically, you know, one or two students would join me for open lunch. And the rule of open lunch was uh, no small talk. It was basically just, let's just dive into like really big questions. What's going on in your life? Uh, what matters to you? That kind of thing. And what I found was that these students were 
really, in this world of ambiguity, they were really wrestling with, with uh, three really big questions. And the three big questions were things like, who am I? What am I going to do? And am I going to make it? Those seemed to be like the three ones that I could kind of categorize these different um, stories into. And I'll just give you a few examples. Like one student um, told me that when she was eight years old, she was sitting in the back seat of her car with her six-year-old brother, and her mom was giving them math flashcards, and her six-year-old brother was beating her on all the flashcards. And she just decided at that time, she just had this idea that, like, I'm not smart, and it just stuck. And she carried this with her all through high school. And so throughout high school, she just played the pretty girl and, you know, didn't really try in school. And then she came to college, and she, her words to me were, you know, Dr. Wesh, I've been faking this so long, I don't even know who I am anymore. And she wanted to figure out who she could really be if she actually tried. Like, who was she? And, and so that was her sort of transformational moment. Um, another student told me about um, how she, uh, when she was uh, growing up, her parents um, started fighting a lot, and they broke up. Uh, her mom got into drugs and was uh, often going out partying at night and would be out all night and sometimes wouldn't come home uh, for a couple of days. And then one, one day she just stopped coming home altogether. And so she was living at home all alone and she was too ashamed to tell anybody at school. And eventually the bills started coming in and she couldn't pay them. She was just faking it. She was going to school pretending like everything was fine at home, but she's actually living all alone. And she finally, she got a foreclosure notice and she went to school that day, and she was acting out in school like she often did. And her English teacher took her out in the hall and started, you know, yelling at her for, for, for messing around in class. And she just started crying, and she, she just said, I don't want to go on anymore. And the, the English teacher took the time to hear her story. And she actually went home with that English teacher and lived with that English teacher ever since. Uh, she actually ended up graduating valedictorian. And she was sitting in my class uh, as an accounting major, uh, but she hates accounting. And <laughs> she, she was an accounting major because it's safe. And she thought, I'll never be homeless if I have a job. Uh, I started to realize through a lot of stories like that, that a lot of students have a very large gap between what they want to do and what they plan to do. And a lot of them are struggling with that gap and trying to figure out what they really want to do. And then I'll just tell a couple more that have to do with the am I going to make it piece of this. Uh, all the students, uh, I never met a student who was, who was so confident that they weren't wrestling with the question of uh, whether or not they're going to make it. And in fact, one, one of my best students ever once handed me a note card after class. And it said on the note card, it said, I know you think I'm amazing. I'm doing all these great things. I need you to know that I'm basically running from a household of suicide, anxiety, and depression. And the harder I push, the more I feel like I'm trapping myself in the cycles that are going to take me down. So she's wondering if she's going to make it. Now, there's another student who also just outstanding student. I thought he had it all figured out. And he came to me asking me whether or not he thought I, that he should drop out uh, because he just wasn't finding what he needed. He didn't have his path. He couldn't find his path here in school. So these were, it started to make me realize that these questions were kind of behind the scenes of all these students. And any sort of approach to teaching that was this mechanical sort of, we're just going to teach you the skills to get a job approach might not be exactly what these students are really looking for. I started to think these students were looking for something bigger and deeper. Uh, I, I just, in my mind, I, I kind of call it like a real education. Like they're looking for... Uh, something more profound than just than just the the skills and things that we often talk about. So, one of the things I also recognized was that uh, these students who are facing ambiguity will often sort of collapse down into this old world of answers, and some of our students will leave basically unchanged because that's where they find security and safety. And somehow we can't let that happen because those students are basically engaging in, like, if you're just looking at answers, you're engaging in what's called strategic learning. You're just trying to get those answers and you end up getting what's called routine expertise. You can handle the routines 
and you'll be fine in jobs that are all about routine, but we know that those jobs are on the decline. They, they're going to be written out by algorithms. In the meantime, if we can somehow get students to embrace ambiguity and emerge in the state of wonder, then they're engaging in deep learning, which develops adaptive expertise, which allows them to transfer their, their abilities and skills into new situations and face bigger and harder problems. So, so that became like my, my goal was to, to get students to that space. Um, but meanwhile, I'm back in this classroom, and it's and I don't know about you guys, but it's actually really psychologically devastating to prepare something, and and you put your heart and soul into it, and you come into a room where people are like looking at their laptops or their phones or sleeping, right? <laughs> and um, so I want to just point out uh, that that this is all happening in this world of like the need for SCHs, which fills this classroom, right? Because that's, that's the money coming in. I'm supposed to be giving SLOs, and I found that there's kind of like this inverted uh, correspondence between meaningful and measurable SLOs. And so like the, we end up somewhere over here, you know, where they're very measurable but not very meaningful. And just to give you a sense of this, like in anthropology, I, I took one of my favorite articles in anthropology. It's by John Komaroff at Chicago. And, and what I did was I, I listed the, the ways he described what a good anthropologist is. And then I I decided to make those into SLOs. And so anthropologists are holistic, which means they have to identify multiple dimensions, connections, and causalities. They practice critical estrangement, which means they have to see beneath surfaces and beyond appearances while attempting to transcend biases and assumptions. We have to map processes by which re social realities are realized, which means we have to understand how we co-construct the world. We have to see the world big and small. We have to identify, apply, and shift perspectives. We have to sit in the immersive ambiguity and uncertainty of a messy problem for an unknowable length of time while slowly giving birth to a meager little insight site, treasure it for a moment, and then throw it away. <laughs> and we have to imagine our way into another's perspective and embrace it, even if or especially if it is contrary to our own. And we have to do all this while understanding ourselves as culturally and temporally bounded entities mired in cultural biases and take it for granted assumptions that we can only attempt to transcend. And that those are real SLOs, right? <laughs> but they're not particularly measurable. Like, th that, those are meaningful. We end up somewhere over here and measurable. Like, this is an actual, from a test bank, from a popular textbook, the smallest class of sound that makes a difference in meaning is a, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, like, like um, so this is where we're at. And I'll just draw your attention here uh, to <clears throat> the, you know, this is the classroom that I face, right? Heads down, some people looking at smartphones and some people, um, falling asleep. So, so ultimately what I ended up doing uh, was, uh, was thinking about like these big SLOs. I'll come back to this, like this crisis significance. And I started a notebook um, over the summer and I just had like, this is my list of lectures. And then this notebook just became just a big mess of regeneration. Like I was just going to redo everything based on this idea that I wanted my students to actually learn something meaningful. And I wasn't going to be OK with just measurable SLOs. I wanted meaningful ones, and I wanted to see what it would like, be like to pursue those. And what I realized was that the entire textbook was really based around measurability rather than anything meaningful. Uh, so it, it tended toward um, definitions and facts that could be like easily replicated on a multiple choice exam rather than anything meaningful. And of course, the whole thing was broken up into 16 chapters, not because that's what's important, but because that's how many weeks there are in a semester. And I thought, you know, let's take all of this. And what I realized was that over the 10 years I'd been teaching by this time, that I had been working really hard to make all this meaningful. And so what I did was I looked underneath the surface, and I'd really invite you guys all to do this, is like try to look under the surface of what it is you're teaching and, and try to get at what you're really trying to say. Most of us are actually saying something really profound behind the scenes, and yet we're sort of clothing it in this more superficial stuff that's more measurable. So get at like that real, at the essence of it. And when, when I did that, I started to realize that what I was doing was Beneath the scenes, I was trying to teach what I call like an ethos of anthropology, where you're asking questions, making connections, and trying new things. You're seeing big, seeing small, and seeing it all. It's the science of human beings, but it's really the art of being human. Uh, we're word weaving and world making. We, uh, we understand that we shape our tools, and then our tools shape us. 
We recognize the realization of reality. We practice empathy, global consciousness. We overcome fear, hate, and ignorance. And we recognize that we make the world. That was the underlying story of my class. And so I decided then to like really make this, um, the whole syllabus into this series of statements that were like these really big, profound statements that was what I was really trying to get at. And then um, I would start a class like this by, by actually reading the syllabus. And I'll just read you the syllabus as I read it in class. I, I kind of make this like a performance in class. And so there's like music and, you know, all that stuff. So here we go. It's going to be a little cheesy. But, um, <laughs> but this is like my, my syllabus. Uh, <clears throat> this is what the reading of the syllabus looks like in class. So, it says, people are different. These differences represent the vast range of human potential and possibility. Our assumptions, beliefs, ideas, ideals, even our abilities are largely a product of our culture. We can respond to such differences with hate and ignorance, or we can choose to open up to them and ask questions we have never considered before. When we open up to such questions, we put ourselves in touch with our higher nature. It was asking questions, making connections, and trying new things that brought us down from the trees and took us to the moon. Our most basic assumptions are embedded in the most basic elements of our everyday lives, our language, our routines and habits, our technologies. We create our tools, and then our tools create us. Most of what we take as reality is a cultural construction, realized through our unseen, unexamined assumptions of what is right, true, or possible. We fail to examine our assumptions not just because they are hard to see, but also because they are safe and comfortable. They allow us to live with the flattering illusion that I am the center of the universe and what matters are my immediate needs and desires. Our failure to move beyond such a view has led to the tragedy of our times, that we are more connected than ever yet feel and act more disconnected. Memorizing these ideas is easy. Living them takes a lifetime of practice. Fortunately, the heroes of all time have walked before us. They show us the path. They show us that collectively, we make the world. Understanding how we make the world, how it could be made or understood differently, is the road toward realizing our full human potential. It is the road to true freedom. So that's the, the opening. Uh, and that, that was all a result of, thank you. <laughs> and, and that was all a result of basically, you know, talking to alumni, talking to my students, and then like getting out like the essence of what it was that I was really trying to teach. And then I sort of realized how like, how meaningless in a way the textbook that I was using was toward achieving that goal. <clears throat> and how expensive it was, and <laughs> and so I decided to write a free textbook, and so <clears throat> so I just wrote this, um, just based on really just based on the lectures I'd been doing for <clears throat> you know for like ten years, and um, so I put this together, and then I put it up online for free, and the students can buy a, a bounded one if they want, but um, <clears throat> most of them just just take the free version, which is which is great, and so then we're back in the classroom, and. We're still not all the way there, like where I want to be. <clears throat> and one of the indicators of that is like students, uh, like this guy here. This is David, and David basically uh, always, always looks like this, or he would look like this. And so every time I saw him, you know, it was like this. <clears throat> and um, so I decided uh, I'll just give you a sense of what this <clears throat> looks like. So. As you know, I've already talked about this, but like I really pay attention to like <clears throat> what people are, are doing in the classroom and somebody sleeping like really affects me. And you know, I have all this like awesome technology <clears throat> and a, a laser pointer to uh, to inspire people, but when he and in one room I actually have four screens and I dance on tables and <clears throat> it's still like it doesn't matter, you know, and so I just like feel crushed. So <clears throat> I got really mad one day about this, and 
Uh, so I decided I was going to approach him. So I'm just going to pause it here for a second and, and remind you of one of the rules. Rule number two, it's all practice. And the reason why I say this is because by living with these rules, like it gave me a sense of inner peace, even in moments like this. And it allowed me to do the following, which is <clears throat> I invited him to lunch. And so we went to lunch and I asked him why he was sleeping in my classes. And he said he was addicted to video games. And, but he said it wasn't just that, he also made games. And he started describing this amazing game on hexagon cards with mythological figures. And I started to realize that he actually knew more about mythology than I did. And I teach a class on mythology. <clears throat> so I started to see him a little differently. And I invited him to be part of a different class. It was going to be an experiment where he wouldn't have to be defined by his grade. We would instead throw away the grades and the textbooks and the lectures. And it would just be a place where we could all meet and share our greatest gifts and do something great together. <clears throat> and so we brought a team together. And uh, it really allowed him to like redefine himself because ultimately what we decided to do was create a video game. And he would work all day and night on this thing. And he really emerged as the hero of the project. And just to give you a sense of what this, this project is, um, so this is a project where they all moved into a retirement community and we made an empathy game about living with Alzheimer's. And this just gives you a sense of what it looks like. It's all based on real memories. So as you like see things in the retirement community, uh, memories come back to you. These are all based on real memories as well. So uh, that was all, um, <clears throat> like I said, these, that's about these students moving into a retirement community. Uh, the retirement community like, gave us a room. They gave us a meal plan. Uh, they let the students like, just, uh, just live with the students. We've been doing this now for, for five years. And uh, it's just an amazing experience for, for all of us. Um, the, the, the elders like learn as much from the students, really. I mean, uh, here's a, a great scene that from... <laughs> so, <clears throat> so just to give you a sense of what this looks like, um, the students do like oral histories and and little documentaries about the about their lives, and they learn all kinds of things about history from a really personal perspective. Uh, and I just want to share a really quick uh, two-minute video that shows you what this looks like here. I was born November the twelfth, nineteen thirty-one. No, I was born in nineteen thirty-four. I was born in nineteen twenty-three. I was born in twenty-four. Mother had all us children at home doctor came out and delivered us. We were all born at home, no hospital. I was born and raised on a farm. Uh, middle of the road, dry land farm. Dad always kept it up. That was a very innocent time of my life. And so I'll just speed it up a little bit here. This is actually a nine minute video, but what they did was they went out and they found the places where these people had lived and they, they lived their lives, um, you know, going to war and uh, the struggles, coming home, starting families, uh, going to work, and ultimately then retiring. But then eventually one of them maybe has a fall and they end up in the retirement community. When you're a caregiver for a long time, it, it runs you down. He went to sleep that night and never did wake up. And he died the last part of January. He just died in his sleep, basically. And he just looked like he always did. But you can't get him back. That was hard. Because I really, really missed him. Boy, I missed him. It, it just hit me that way. He wasn't here. To live in this world. You must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal. To hold it against your bones. Knowing that your own life depends on it. And when the time comes. To let it go. Let, Let it go. go. And uh, 
these projects like this, of course, you know, like, it was a beautiful project, uh, but it also, what really matters, of course, is how it changes the students. And so, you know, Jordan, who is one of those uh, people I mentioned earlier, who was actually thinking about dropping out of school, after this project, he decided to take the plunge, and he did drop out of school. Uh, he sold his car, he bought a bike, and he just started riding south. He rode uh, through Oklahoma, Texas, through Mexico, down into Central America, lived with Mayan families for a while, and after seven months, he finally figured it out. He decided he knew what he wanted to do. He came back and, in a fury of passion, wrote a series of essays uh, that ultimately won him a Marshall Scholarship, which is one of the most uh, prestigious scholarships in the world. And he went off to the UK uh, for his graduate school. Um, so it was uh, so so it was uh, that that kind of experience, like, and actually looking at Jordan when he came back, uh, that reminded me that my ultimate goal in all of this was really to uh, experience the lives of students in some meaningful way, so that I could be a better teacher, and. I was still struggling in the big class. I had this little small class that was experimental where we were really doing field work. I felt like my students were really learning what anthropology is all about. But my big class was still not working. It wasn't, it still was like lacking in engagement. It was still, uh, the assignments were, you know, a lot of students were just kind of getting by on them. And so I told them these stories about field work and I would share with them what my other class was doing. And I was like, you know, do you think we could do that in here? And, and you know, they were like, yeah, you know, we could try. And, and, uh, but they wanted me to do it as well. And I thought that's great because, you know, this is all about participation and I want to be a student as well. So I basically became a student in my own class. And because the assignment was to go do field work that makes you uncomfortable, <clears throat> I gave them the uh, choice of where I would have to do field work. And they said, well, we want you to come out with us. And so uh, they invited me out for a night. And I have three small boys. And so I haven't, I haven't actually seen the hours of between like 11 to 3 since like, I feel like 10 years at least, you know. So, so they took me out on the town. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I went on, I put on my student disguise, which is just a baseball hat backwards. And, <laughs> and then uh, they took me out to the clubs. And as, you know, I'm back like in Papua New Guinea, basically. I mean, this is as, as weird as it gets for me. And I really want to dance. I want to like join the dance. I know how important that is, but it's kind of intimidating. You know, it's not just shaking your tail feather. This is <laughs> complicated stuff. Uh, and eventually, uh, this guy dances up to me. And he would become like my guru for the night. <laughs> and uh, so, so we end up kind of uh, developing a, re a relationship <laughs> together, like dancing and whatnot. And then I, I interviewed him later, just to, you want know, to hear his, a bit of his story here. Um, he's from he's from China. Uh, and I asked him why he came to Manhattan. Uh, this is Manhattan, Kansas, by the way. <laughs> That's a really funny thing. This city got Manhattan, right? You know, the, I, I, I thought the Manhattan... Oh, that's really cool, man. Had a big city. Yeah. Yeah, in New York. <laughs> no, okay. I said, uh, yeah, okay, okay, man. Is yeah, cool. That they sent me here. Oh man. <laughs> no. So then, uh, I it was really interesting to hear a story, you know, coming here, and then he told me about how much he struggled with English when he first got here, and so he got really depressed, and he would just hang out in his room and close out the world and and just watch YouTube videos all the time. This is the first year, uh, cause I li I live in, in the dorms, so I think I, cause my English is not good before I come here, so I just uh, stay at the dorm, watch some videos, play the games, and uh, yeah, I I didn't go out, didn't talk with anybody, and I just uh, stay at the dorm and watch the video and uh, try to learn. And so mostly he was hard, yeah. <laughs> you know. It was hard, he says. And mostly he would actually watch rap videos and try to learn the English. And so he actually has like, you can kind of hear it now and then, he has like kind of this rap lingo that will sneak in there. Um, but he mostly just watched rap videos and tried to learn how to, how to talk. 
And he had this amazing moment where he was basically studying Eminem. <laughs> and uh, here he The first about song, that. Learn to Lose Yourself. I can sing a little bit. If you had one shot, one opportunity to see everything you ever wanted, one moment, would you capture or just a sleep? And he told me about how he used to just sleep to, you know, when he was depressed. It's a palm of sweaty, needs weak arms are heavy, there's vomit and sweat already, mop spaghetti, he's nervous, but on surface looks calm and ready to drop bombs, but he keeps on forgetting what he wrote down, he won't crowd, go so loud, he opens his mouth, but the words don't come out, yeah. And he just kept on reflecting on how this song like was his life, you know, like the words wouldn't come out. Um, eventually, I asked him what he thought of like. You lose to yourself. Of like yourself. you stand, like you're uh, the huge forest. The only, only a person, only you, stand uh, in in the forest. You can find a way to get out. You can, you like this, yeah. You know, yeah. you know what I'm thinking. Yeah. And basically. You know, I realized just how much his life was like mine. When I was in New Guinea, I had this same sort of culture shock moment of feeling kind of lost. And Lose Yourself was actually one of my anthems as I came into my job was like this sense of like, you know, you have one shot, one opportunity. <laughs> and, like, and, I, and that night I was trying to get into that space of losing yourself and, and feeling that, what that feels like again. Um, so eventually he does sort of figure things out through dance. Mostly. Yeah, after one year, I think, uh, yeah, that you, you should uh, talk with people and uh, you should, like, uh, yeah, that I think after one year, I changed the back. So mostly, he found himself through dance, as he describes it here. Music, dances, it's an international yeah. <laughs> language. <Yeah. laughs> And he learned dancing the same way he learned how to talk, mostly by... I always watch some videos, like uh, some really, really cool guy. <laughs> they dance on, uh, and they record uh, themselves. So I, I always watch famous rappers. They, they move the really, like nature, like free. So he has all these amazing moves, and his best move is what I call like the magic mirror. So what he'll do is he'll like, he'll look across the room and he'll see what somebody's doing, and then he'll just like slow it down into like this awesome movement. So it's hard to see here, but uh, Adam is over here. He's one of my hosts uh, from my, one of my students, and he's like just flailing around, and he does this thing like real smooth. And now he's doing my dance, which is apparently like wearing a baseball hat and hiding from everybody. And, <laughs> and and, uh, he just kept doing that uh, to me and just sort of trying to call me into the dance. And this was his way of operating. It was really quite beautiful. Um, but, you know, I still couldn't find a way to move. And one of the one of my realizations during this time, as we came to the last, one of the last songs here, and you can hear them all, like, still trying to encourage me, like, trying to get me to dance. But I'm just kind of, like, my arms are on lockdown. I just can't, like, find a way to move. <laughs> so I'm just kind of, like, bouncing around like this or something, right? And so, like, the rules are reversed here, student and teacher. I just can't find my groove in any way. And mostly because I'm such an intellectual, like, I'm always in my head. And I'm listening to the lyrics. And I don't know if you know this song. Um, but it just didn't seem appropriate to be dancing <laughs> to this song. Like, uh, I don't know if you know the lyrics, but here's the key one. It's basically, I only F you when it's half past five, which, like, I'm a happily married 42-year-old guy. Like, it just didn't seem <laughs> like the right thing to be dancing to. And so I'm still, like, on lockdown. But then I look over at... Um, at Ming Shin, and he's just doing his thing and like calling people into his dance and doing this just beautiful movements. And I just start moving my arms, and it was a funny thing. Like I remember like moving my arms like past here, and then it was like the switch went off and I was free. <laughs> and like, and and I had this revelation and thinking about it later that really clarified things for me and my teaching as well. And that was that I realized that that night and in life in general, that I couldn't just think my way into a new way of living. 
you ultimately have to live your way into a new way of thinking. And that became like a phrase that just dawned on me that night that then stuck with me and guided me through uh, my, my future in teaching. And it struck me that it was this precise thing that you, can't, that you have to live your way into a new way of thinking, which is why Jordan had to ultimately quit school for a while and, and travel south. It's why Ming Shen had to come out to the bars. It's why I had to go out to the bars. And that was 2016. So 2016 was an interesting year. Um, I kind of finally felt like I had a, <clears throat> a, a, a something figured out. I was ready to go with my teaching again. I thought I was really excited to, to try out some new things. Uh, Jordan and Kinsey both had a really successful year. Their, um, their, their film went to a film festival in Paris. But what was really cool was how much they had changed. And a lot of that, I think, was through the project and, and through their realization of, of their own self-efficacy and the things that they could do. So Kinsey was actually that eight-year-old that I was telling you about who thought she wasn't smart. And here she had completely transformed herself. And she actually found a passion in the midst of all of this. Uh, her passion became uh, sustainable protein. And so she started, she started a little insect farm and started selling cricket protein. Um, she went to Thailand and learned more about this. Um, she has her own business now selling insect protein online, and she's a PhD, fully funded PhD student at the University of California in Santa Barbara, uh, which is quite a long way from the eight-year-old who uh, thought she wasn't smart. And it really was uh, literally a banner year for us. Uh, we were put on banners all over the place because of Jordan's, <laughs> because of Jordan's Marshall Scholarship and Kinsey's success. Uh, and then we were paraded out in front of all the big donors. And um, we were like the headline act for the $1.4 billion campaign for K-State. And um, <clears throat> this, this led to great new buildings for the College of Business and the College of Engineering. Uh, they got these cool water fountains. and. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then, like, back in, in my, and this is in my uh, hall, um, we, we actually have a pool. We all pay, like, $5 a month for water, and uh, our internet uh, comes in at a blazing 6.4 megabits per second, uh, which is the Cox starter package. And... Um, and, yeah, and even worse, 2016, we started losing lines. So, okay. <laughs> um, so th this was really hard. And uh, the, 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 the push back to us when we said, you know, we can't even continue. Like, this is an existential crisis. We can't teach. We have seven faculty. We now have five. Uh, they promised to bring us back to six. And we're like, we, we actually can't cover our basic classes. We just provided a Marshall Scholar for you. That sequence of classes is no longer available because of what you've done to us. And they said, you can teach online, increase enrollment, and pay for your own lines. So that was the, that was the pushback. Um, and, you know, there was really no alternative. Uh, they'd already spent all their money on those buildings <laughs> that you just saw. And we were actually, like, paying maintenance on those buildings. Uh, so just budget crisis and really hard times. And I decided to just embrace this. You know, this, this was, I, I had no choice but to embrace it. And I had never taught online before, but I thought, what would it be like to really embrace this and just go for it? What if I applied this basic idea that, that, that you have to live your way into a new way of thinking into an online class? And what if I kept, stayed true to the rules that Georgia taught me of trying new things, realizing it's all practice, and that failure is fun and fascinating? with trusting that growth is ultimately real. And so I came up with three guiding principles to develop this class. Uh, I wanted to create anthropology for everyone. That is, it was going to be open, free, and accessible. Uh, I wanted the, the world to be the classroom. I wanted to think outside the box and not, not just put lectures online, but think about what would it look like if we really made the classroom the world itself. And then the third thing, back to that phrase of basically you have to live to learn. And uh, this is day one. Uh, Alexa, what's on the calendar today? Today, there is one event remaining. At 6 a.m., there's record anthropology class opening video.
Yeah, so I had this idea of like sort of integrating teaching into my life, right? And and so the first one, I was going to show them the pace of change and how it changed over time by starting at the top of this hill and rollerblading to the bottom, and then showing them how population like exploded by going around the corner, and showing like sort of that hockey stick thing, um, but that didn't work out. <laughs> um, so. Um, and, and I was teaching it in the summer, and I had to do uh, a schedule, like 24 videos in 40 days. I had to like keep up with these things. And so two days later, I was out here. I wanted to do like a lecture on like humans' ability to run like really long ways. And so I was going to do like a marathon lecture. So I'm actually like holding the camera, and the drone is just sitting there uh, filming this at the same time. We're going to have to run a really long way to make this happen, because i got a lot to show you. First, we're going to go right over there, through the woods, and then over there, uh, across the bridge. something like 41 miles, I'm not sure. But, uh, just hang with me. So then the wind picked up and you can't hear me. And so this was also a failure. Um, <laughs> so uh, eventually I, I was able to make some content for the class. And the basic way it works is it's all on anth101.com for free. And uh, the, the videos get placed here as part of lessons. Um, and the, the book is there, and so the, the students like see the video lessons, they, they read the book. Uh, I've developed all sorts of new techniques for teaching out on the road, and so like I use a bandana for lecture notes, and I can just like flip it up as I have a new point to make kind of thing. Um, I've learned to fly drones and lecture and run at the same time, uh, which is fun. And what's really cool though is, uh, one of the most, I think, most profound things about this and the invitation to you guys is that uh, if this is part of the future of higher ed where we do make more videos, uh, one of the neat things about this is the way you can translate kind of big national issues into local issues. So I'm not the first one to talk about structural racism uh, or anything like that, but I, but I am one of the first ones to make a video about it in our community. And that made a big difference in our community. So I, I did a, a video along with a former student uh, in which we just looked at the racial disparity uh, between these two sides. Uh, these, are, these places here are just a mile apart uh, in Kansas City. And you can see just the tremendous gap in wealth between the two sides. And uh, the one side is almost entirely white, the other side is entirely black. And there's a history to that. There's a, a structural history in which, um, you know, J.C. Nichols and other people blocked people, uh, had racially restrictive covenants, so black people could not move into the new neighborhoods and so on. So a lot of people didn't know that history. I was amazed at how many local people didn't know that history. And most people's explanations of that was simply that those people in that poor neighborhood are lazy. And that was like their basic understanding of it. So I think it was a real gift that we were able to bring this kind of knowledge to people. And you know, we, we, because it's an open class, this video in particular got a lot of traction. Over two million people uh, saw this video. And, and, it, and it just means a lot to do that. So, of course, we also want to have people live their way into a new way of thinking. So it's not just about the lessons, but also every lesson is paired with a challenge. So there's a 10 lessons and 10 challenges. 
So uh, the lesson of people are different leads to the challenge of talking to strangers. And so then students uh, put everything on Instagram with the hashtag Anth101, and they populate this, this thing. It's very much like the humans of Oshkosh that Grace showed, which was uh, so great. And they basically create this sort of uh, humans of the world thing. And some of the, you know, great ones like this one here uh, was just done at Walmart where a student encountered this couple and, and he asked them, what's your favorite thing about being in love with each other? And he just answered this. And then he started up his motorcycle and rode off into the sunset. Or this one, um, this woman here was pushing carts. She says, I'm pushing carts now to get in shape for my surgery. I'm donating my kidney to my sister. Wow, you're a hero. No, I'm no hero. Just making my world a better place like I'm supposed to do. And he says, I met Leah while she was frantically trying to save the life of a baby bird whose wings had gotten crushed by a shopping cart. Then I looked at the tattoo on her arm. So then lesson three, for example, is uh, you heard from the syllabus, it's asking questions, making connections, and trying new things that brought us down from the trees and took us to the moon. And so in this lesson, the challenge is to try new things. And so on Instagram, students start trying new things, you know. And, uh, so there's backflips, music instruments, um, you know, writing, uh, journaling, uh, all kinds of different things that people try. And people do get better. Rotate, land. Yes, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> and, and of course, like, uh, again, like, this is all very participatory, so me and my uh, fellow teachers are all involved as well. And so I decided to try violin. This is day one. <laughs> I almost had the first two notes, right? So that was supposed to be a Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. This is uh, day four. And then uh, this is my colleague, Ryan Klotaski, who's helping develop Ant 101. And uh, he tried the banjo, so this is us forming our little band here. <laughs> and then this is day uh, 14, and we've got some students now joining us. We have a little band. All of them have new instruments they had never played 14 days ago. And it's so fun to like learn together, right? Because like I don't want to like. 14 days into my violin playing with people who've been playing for years, you know. This was great. Uh, and then on the 28th day, um, we all get together and actually perform. And we call ourselves a 28-day band. <laughs> Uh, and this stuff, uh, because this is a free open class, then there's like uh, other classes around uh, the nation uh, who are using it as well. We haven't promoted it at all. These are people who just stumbled across it on um, Google at this point, and we'll start promoting it here this next year. But we already have uh, classes uh, from all over the place, Ohio State, Agnes Scott, um, many different classes, about 15 different classes involved. Uh, and we actually have like a back-end uh, Google group where we share like um, best practices and it, things like quiz questions and discussion questions and things like that. Lesson eight, uh, we are more connected than ever, yet feel and act more disconnected. This is where we really get into that idea of the world as classroom. And one of the best things I, I like about this class is that because we're not tied to a classroom, I don't have to have TAs in the classroom. I can instead fund my TAs to go to interesting places. My name is Ben and I'm in Jakarta, Indonesia. Hi, my name's Matt and I'm in Barcelona, Spain. I'm Amy and I'm headed to Samoa. I'm Darren Wilkinson and I'm here in Zambia. Let's go Zambia, let's go. If you're so, so all these TAs, like this is Garrett in Zambia. Um, you saw Amy there, in, and she's in Samoa, um, and then Ben in, in Indonesia. Like, and these are all, like, any time like, we had something come up in class, we could actually uh, use them as resources. So, for example, here's, here's uh, Garrett in Zambia. This is his little opening uh, video as he's traveling to Zambia. Uh, and he won the TA ship because he had an opportunity to work with an anthropologist in Zambia uh, on, on women's maternal health issues, uh, as you'll see here. So welcome to Zambia. I'm here in Kabwe with my friend Nick, working on a USAID project uh, for maternal and child health. 
So uh, he actually also won a Marshall Scholarship. Um, and so we've had quite a good run there with that. But look how great this is when we have these resources. Like one of the things we did was um, about, at, by lesson eight, um, the Alexa, you know, our little Echo, uh, Amazon Echo, had become kind of a character in some of the films. And so we decided to ask her like where she came from. Hi. Hi, Alexa. Where are you from? The company that made me, Amazon, is based in Seattle, Washington. And of course, she wouldn't actually answer where she was from. Like, we wanted to know, like, who actually made you? Like, where did the parts come from? And so ultimately, um, we had to break it down piece by piece. And we had uh, Garrett in uh, Zambia, where we think the copper came from. And so we also have Garrett in Africa, starting from the ground up, actually starting with where the materials come from. He's going to be looking at mines in Zambia. Here in Kabwe, Zambia, at Black Mountain, one of the most toxic sites in the world. And then, um, uh, as Faye mentioned, like most recently, like I decided to track down my suit, and so I went off to to Vietnam. Kids were struggling, <laughs> um, but we did like end up uh, finding uh, this guy who who thinks he might have made my suit because uh, he makes suits just like that. But then they put the label on it, and they're not sure like who actually sells the suits. Um, and he actually then I'll just I'll just skip skip around a little bit here, but he actually uh, takes me out to his. Um, I get this to work. Yeah, he actually takes me out to his his. Uh, his factory, and I get to meet some of the people who, who might have actually made uh, my suit. And so th this is all really great, you know, engaging stuff for the students who then can also, like, uh, write to me. They see me on Instagram. They see where I'm at, and they can find out more about what's going on um, on the ground. So uh, then the students, of course, are doing their own Challenge 8s. They're trying to reach out around the world and find people who made the stuff that they have and, and and kind of draw that connection. So you see students like actually Skyping with uh, factory managers in Bangladesh and all kinds of interesting projects like that. Um, ultimately, the whole goal of this is to get students to really experience difference, experience differently, and experience more. This is me uh, going line dancing, which I never do. This is my sister <laughs> trying to teach me how to line dance. Uh, because ultimately, I find that learning anthropology is a shift in disposition a new way of being in the world. And finally, lesson nine is this point that memorizing these ideas is easy, but living them takes a lifetime of practice. And heroes show us the path. So in, in lesson nine and 10, it becomes a more reflective piece, and the students reflect on uh, who they are and where they're going and, and try to incorporate these into their lives. And I'll just uh, share with you a quick reflection from one of the students, one of the online students here. just compounding these 10 challenges into eight weeks has just like super awakening. And I didn't expect to be that, that to happen. Like I'm 27, like I have gone out to the world and I have experienced things, but yet still like this 200 level anthropology class has like given me like tools to sort of deal with things that I either didn't know I was still dealing with or have not dealt with completely or in a healthy fashion. And like that is worth every cent I've had to pay for this class. Okay. And, uh, and I'll just wrap things up here real quick. I'll just show you. Oh, yeah, that's right. Does this work? 
So here's, here's by the numbers, uh, in, case, in case you're wondering. So ultimately, we were able to increase enrollment by 825 SCHs. We actually do have to keep track of those things. Uh, and that's $378,000 in revenue. Uh, the students rate at 4.7 to 4.9, uh, 5.0 in student evaluations. Our majors went up by 10%. And we, as of yesterday, I got the email that we officially have one and a half new lines hired. Uh, so these people are actually coming on board with us. We know who they are, and we're really excited to have them. Um, in, a, in a short, like we're back uh, to a place where we can continue to produce Marshall Scholars and all the other uh, wonderful people that we, we want to try to produce. So um, that's, that's um, my story, and I'm, I'm excited to you know, talk to you guys some more this afternoon with questions and whatnot. Thanks.